Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where in the world you are. It's great to see so many of you joining us tonight, today, in this presentation of uh, the very exciting uh, Vicuña district, an emerging giant copper gold silver district in, in Argentina, Chile. And as you know, we normally do these uh, company presentations, but today we're looking at the, the bigger picture, taking a step back and, and uh, talking about this whole district. And uh, with us tonight to do that is uh, Wojtek Wojcicki, CEO of uh, NGX Minerals and also board member of uh, Filo Mining and uh, Jose Maria Resources. And uh, Neil O'Brien, who's the former VP Exploration of, for uh, Lundin Mining. So two of the most senior geologists in uh, the Lundin Group, uh, which should make for a very interesting presentation. Uh, on the line with us, we also have uh, Adam Lundin, who's the CEO of uh, Jose Maria Resources and the chairman of, uh, uh, of uh, Philo Mining. And we have Jamie Beck, the CEO of Philo. Uh, and uh, Adam and Philo, and Adam and uh, Jamie will be able to answer specific questions on, on the companies uh, at the end of the presentation. And my name is Robert Eriksson. I work with Investor Relations Corporate Communication for the Lundin Group based out of Stockholm, uh, together with my colleagues in uh, Vancouver. Uh, so practicalities, we have a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, do not use the chat function, but the Q&A function. So you type your questions and uh, they will be uh, answered at the end of uh, after the presentation. And we have plenty of time, uh, so we'll stay on here as long as you have questions. And uh, hopefully you will find this an interesting uh, presentation. So with no further ado, I would uh, like to leave the floor over to uh, Adam Lundin to make an introduction. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. Thanks for the intro. I just want to say a, a few quick words before handing it off to Neil and Wojtek and, and how we got here today. So after Philo's Hole 41, uh, my father enthusiastically called Neil and asked if he could put a document together with his views. After reading the paper from Neil, my father's enthusiasm grew and asked Neil if he could convert his findings into a presentation. After receiving the presentation, we felt this needed to be shared with the world. And today marks the seventh and first virtual presentation on the Vicuña District. Before Neil and Wojtek kick it off, I'd just like to also take the time to summarize an email I received from a friend he wished me a happy holidays and shared his gratitude for the gratitude for the NGX resources financing in February of 2016. In February 2016, NGX raised $8 million at 60 cents a share. Following that, August in 2016, for every four shares in NGX, uh, he received one share in Philo. In July 2019, NGX resources changed its name to Jose Maria resources and shareholders received one share of NGX uh, minerals for every two shares they held of Jose Maria. My friend originally subscribed for 300 grand in the February 2016 placement in NGX minerals. His original 500,000 shares in NGX minerals are now broken down into 500,000 shares in Jose Maria, 125,000 shares in Philo Mining, 250,000 shares in NGX minerals. The original $300,000 investment is now worth $2.38 million today. And, you know, very happy that we can create the shareholder value for our shareholders. And I believe, you know, we're still at the beginning of this great journey with a lot of share price appreciation ahead. And with that, I'll hand it over to Neil and Wojtek. Thank you. Well, thanks, Adam and Robert. Um, great introduction. I think we'll just dive right into things here. So, you know, as as the introduction stated, uh, the Lundin Group has been working for almost 20 years in a region along the Chile-Argentina border that we think is really emerging and developing into the next big copper gold district, copper gold silver district um, in the central Andes. So today's presentation is really focused on the geology and kind of the evidence that, that we've put together that Neil has summarized um, for why we think this is a district that's ultimately going to take its place among the giants of, uh, of this region. So, um, you know, there's a long presentation here. This will all be posted. 
Uh, we're not going to go through all of it, um, basically just slides one through 32, but there are some corporate summaries in the back um, that give you a bit more detail on each one of the companies. And as Robert said, um, all three CEOs are, are on this call. And if there are company specific questions, we can deal with those uh, at the end of the presentation. So, you know, there's no question that this is a great time to be in the copper business. We feel that this is a great time to be bringing forward a district and projects like the ones that we've got. You've all heard about the energy transition. Um, you know, I think after spending a, the last week in Europe, uh, you know, we're even more convinced that, you know, this is, this is real. And um, I, I think the key thing about this cycle that we really feel we're at the beginning of is that it's unlike the last cycle, which was very much driven by the industrialization and urbanization of China. This is something that's going to happen um, across the developed world. So, you know, Japan, Europe, North America, China, everybody has to go through this energy transition in a relatively narrow window. And that energy transition, renewable energy, electric vehicles, all of it is extremely copper intensive. So, you know, this copper price spike that we've seen uh, over the last six months or so, we think is just the beginning of a sustained um, new bull cycle. And, uh, you know, on the supply side of the business, we all know that um, there's been quite a long, long period of underinvestment in exploration. There's not a lot of projects in the pipeline. So this is an excellent time um, to be delivering a, a, a brand new district into the market. So, you know, I know there's a lot of technical people on this call who are very familiar with this, but for, for everyone else, the reason we're talking about the Central Andes and the reason that we are here is because you've got to go where the metal is. And the Central Andes are the Saudi Arabia of the copper business. They host um, just, just over 40% of global copper resources, produce just under 40. Um, most of that comes from Chile and Peru. Uh, but we strongly feel that Argentina is going to be an important contributor going forward. As many of you know, um, the political border between Argentina and Chile splits a single geological province. Um, the world's greatest copper province in Chile is, is, is just across that political line. There's been much more exploration on the Chilean side, much less on the Argentine side for a variety of reasons. But, you know, we've always believed that the geological potential is equal. And I think the, the presentation that you're going to see today is going to demonstrate you know, why we've had that confidence in the geology of Argentina. So you know, what, what our thesis here today is that you know, most of that copper that comes from the Central Andes actually comes from a handful of super giant districts. And many of the names on this map will be familiar to you. These are the giants of the copper industry. And, you know, we've had a growing conviction over the last year or so that, that our Vicuña um, district, our Vicuña cluster is kind of emerging and, and over time is going to take its place among these industry giants. And, you know, that'll be the guts of the presentation that Neil O'Brien gives a little bit later on uh, to demonstrate why we think that's the case. So we do get a lot of questions about Argentina and the, we've got a little short video here to show you just how long the Lundin Group has been working in Argentina and how successful we have been over time. So Adam Lundin, who you heard from uh, at the beginning of this presentation, is actually the third generation of, of Lundins that have been active uh, in Argentina. And that involvement started with Bajo de la Lumbrera, uh, Adolf and Lucas Lundin acquiring that project, which was ultimately uh, taken over and put into production and until recently was Argentina's largest copper gold producer. Uh, the group then continued on with the same local team, which is an extremely important part of this story. Uh, and that group went on to make the grassroots discovery at Veladero that ultimately ended up in Barrick. That same on the ground team uh, then continued and acquired the ground and started to work on the projects that we're presenting today. So that's just a bit of an intro to just a short video that illustrates that long history.
So I'm just going to quickly go through um, a little bit of the history and how we got to where we are. So, you know, these projects are really a testament to an almost 20 year commitment to exploring in this region. Um, these, these projects have all been through several different Lundin Group entities, um, you know, all each, each served a, a, a purpose. But I, I guess the core of the story starts in 2009 when these assets were brought into a company called NGX Resources, which we heard about a little bit earlier in Adam's introduction. Uh, that company had three early stage exploration projects in Chile and Argentina, a market cap of around $40 million in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008. So over the next few years, uh, we did a lot of drilling, made three big discoveries, Los Salados in Chile, Jose Maria just across the border in Argentina, and then Filo del Sol, which may end up being the biggest of them all um, right on the in Argentina, but very close to the Chile-Argentina border. So as those discoveries developed, um, you know, we realized that maybe we weren't getting full value in a multi-project um, company. So, and we, we particularly felt strongly about the potential of the Filo del Sol project, and we didn't think we were getting value for it. So in 2016, Filo, the Filo del Sol project was spun out into its own standalone vehicle, Filo Mining. Um, very quickly, that company kind of equaled the market cap of, um, of the company it was spun out from. Um, Lots of exploration success followed, and that's now a 1.5 billion market cap uh, TSX listed company. Uh, there's a pre-feasibility study that was completed in 2019, but a lot of the recent share price strength has been on the back of some spectacular exploration success in drilling that's been done below that pre-feasibility study pit. In 2019, the Jose Maria project had come far enough along that we thought it was ready for its own corporate home. And so we separated um, Los Alados and Jose Maria into two separate companies. Jose Maria is now separately listed around a 500 million market cap a feasibility study completed in early 2021 and is now heading down the pathway to an eventual construction decision. Um, fiscal stability negotiations are underway. You saw that in the video uh, and environmental permits were, or the application for environmental permits was submitted, submitted in February. And we're, you know, we're hoping that fiscal stability and environmental permits uh, uh, come shortly. NGX Minerals is separately traded, holds the Los Alados project. Um, you know, that's a really, it's actually the largest resource in the district currently. We're planning some additional exploration focused on the high grade core of that deposit, uh, hopefully in the first half of 2022. So what I want to do now is just get, kind of give you a quick introduction to the district in a, in a flyover video. So it goes by pretty quick. So I just want to give, give you a bit of an introduction for what you're going to see. We're going to start kind of zoomed out, looking at the coast of South America, zoom in, fly over first Los Alados, then head eight kilometers across the border into Argentina to take a look at Jose Maria, and then finish up over the Fila del Sol project. So it's a good overview of the district and it'll serve as a good introduction to Neil's talk, which will follow. It's the Jose Maria deposit in the background.
So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Neil O'Brien to walk us through why we think this is the next big copper gold district in the Chilean Andes. Neil? Yeah, thanks, Voight. Um, it's good, great to be here. Thanks for, the, uh, for all of you out there taking the time to um, uh, join our, our webinar here. Yeah, as Wojtek said, the you know the thesis of, of the talk here is is to um, is on the on the district here that we call the Vicuña district uh, as in a and look at it as we have in the past few months as an as an emerging giant copper gold silver district and you know the way of uh, that we've gone about it here really is you need to to go and compare against. Um, some well-known benchmarks. So let's let's start there, uh, and that's really what the, the this first slide is is about. You know, the discovery and control of the world's giant metal districts is the holy grail of the mining industry, and it's uh, of course the transformational building block of any globally significant mining company. Um, as you see on the right, there I've provided some examples of some giant metal districts, including Escondida, uh, Chuquicamata. Um, I threw Red Dog in there just so that, um, you know, we're not just talking about copper giants, really. Uh, it's not really about the commodity, the metal, the deposit type. Um, as, as we'll see, there's, they share underlying common uh, um, formational characteristics to a large degree. And, and the final one there, Grassberg being the world's largest gold deposit, and I believe the world's third largest um, uh, copper deposit. You know, these, these giant metal districts, they, they truly are. You know, the gifts that keep on giving, they produce a lot of the world's metal out of, um, you, you know, a few um, locations. Um, so when you find something big, as the slide says here, you need to think bigger. And, and that really, you know, what it means is all, all of those giants, and you can use whatever examples of known giants uh, that you like. Uh, I've, I've just provided a few on the right there. But they all grew out of a significant initial discovery. But they did grow into a giant district. Right, and, and that's really the key here. So, you know, early on, if, if there's a significant discovery made, and sometimes it, it may not be initially seen as uh, significant, but, um, you know, it's a job of any exploration geologist, you know, that all investors really want to know early on is, is how do you know you got a giant before it's a giant? So a lot, a lot of what we've done here is on a comparative um, 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 basis. And I, I think uh, we'll give you a snapshot of that kind of thought process as we went through here um, so that you could at least understand how we arrived at our, um, our, our, our stated thesis here. So, you know, geologically, um, yeah, giant metal deposits, they're, they're freaks of nature, right? They are oversized concentration of metals. There are clusters of multiple mineralizing events, um, commonly of different character. When you look at uh, one of the examples there, Chiki Kamata, you know, the, the, the original discovery there that they've pitted for well over a, a century, I mined for over a century now is, you know, sure, it's got a lot of copper, very, it's high grade, it, 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 it's full of a lot of um, pyrite and, and, and it's high arsenic. And yet less than two kilometers um, to the north of there was found Redemir Tomic, which is, is quite different character low pyrite and, 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 uh, and no arsenic. Just south of there, you know, you've got high grade coppers, calcocytes sitting in gravels and, 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 and others, you know, along that uh, 10 kilometer more trend there. So, you know, giants have a way of doing what they want to do. You, you know, you really need to expect the unexpected when you're dealing with a giant and not make up, you know, your mind too early on on what do you think is representative um, you, you know, for that, for that district. It's a common misunderstanding, I think, when you look at the case histories. Expecting the unexpected is, is important. You know, one of the, you, you know, one of the examples that I got to know quite well, um, you know, really emphasized that to me. One of the world's best tin deposits in, is, in fact, hiding in a copper zinc deposit in Portugal that's named Neves Corvo. Right, um, you know, some unusual things happen in, in, in giants that really kind of rewrite the rule books, if you will. I expect more good surprises than bad because they are robust mineralizing events. Um, you know, I look to look at, at Red Dog, Red Dog, Maine, the, the, you know, the original discovery there is 20% is zinc. And because there's been uh, at least five zinc mineralizing events all on top of each other, I mean, that deposit type typically, you know, it's three or 4% zinc. It could be quite large, but they're typically, 
not that great unless you've got a, a repeated succession of enriching processes all you know going on the same rock column and that's really you know what you need to look for early on if you think uh, that uh, you may have a giant in your hand they are hard to find yeah but they're easy to overlook um, you know the first discovery is not necessarily representative of the whole. Um, when I was putting this together, I was reminded of the discovery history of Escondida, which of course means a hidden one, but in reality, it was really hidden in plain sight. If you go back to the early part of last century, you know, the Ch Chilean copper industry was already, you know, rolling for several decades. Chuki Camada was the world's largest, largest copper mine already. It had been going for a few decades and, and you know, a few hundred kilometers south of there, um, there was another significant mining district by the name of El Salvador. And about almost exactly in between about 200 kilometers south of Chuki, um, where Escondida is located, it wasn't as if there was nothing to be seen there. Um, there is, in fact, a, an enormous um, uh, color anomaly, alteration zone that um, had attracted the attention of, of, of geologists, you know, back then. It was sampled. No one could ever get a, you know, any any copper out of it. They really only drilled short holes back then, and it, it, it was just became known as uh, just just that, you know, somewhere that uh, a large alteration zone color anomaly that you're never going to get any copper out of. And it took a number of decades um, till 1981, actually, to um, for someone to drill a hole deep enough to get under what was later recognized as this almost perfectly leached cap um, into a, uh, I think it was about a, a 50 meter thick zone of, of one and a half, two percent copper enrichment zone, you know, and the rest is, is history there, but, um, the, the, you know, it, it stood misunderstood and, and it remained hidden in plain sight for, for quite a long time. And, and I, I bring this up because the story of Acuna is actually quite similar from the beginning. You know, it was Filo del Sol that, that brought the uh, original lending geologists, you know, in, into that district. Um, and it was also hiding in plain sight. There was, there was an enormous alteration zone visible from space there with some copper oxides that surfaced in this case. But like Escondida, the system is obvious, but it took a while, 20 years in fact, to drill the deeper holes that found, you know, the heart of the system. Next slide there, Voight, please. So I'll give you, a, as I said, just a, a snapshot of the, the, the kind of comparative process that we went through. So giant metal districts, you know, they are unique, they're complex, but many share the same, you know, some of the same characteristics. And, and I'll just use three to uh, illustrate the, um, you know, the point here, the comparative point. So we'll be looking at, at, at scale. Um, you know, clusters and, um, if you will, call them all um, or structures, but keeping in mind that there's a much longer checklist here um, to compare against. Go ahead, Boyd. Yeah. So when Lucas called me back in, in May, you know, he was, he was, he was terribly excited and, and he said, you know, I think we've got a giant here. And, you know, right away, <laughs> You know, what I thought was giant, okay, we're going to have to nail that term down, I mean, you, you, you know, because uh, uh, if you're going to do something comparative and be fair and actually me be meaningful, you, you really have to use words that, um, you know, have, have more rigorous, you know, definitions. Everybody, you know, has heard the, the, the terms like world class and they really don't mean a lot. Um, so what I did early on in this was go back to and find a, um, you know, a, 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 a classification system for copper deposits based on contained copper. And um, there was one uh, that the Society of Economic uh, Geology uh, uh, um, brought out in a 1993 workshop at Queen's University that happened to be called Giant Ore Deposits. So I went back to that and I thought, well, it's, you know, you can use whatever classification system you like. The, the important thing here is that it's rigorous and it's defined and you can use the same on, on you know, the known examples with, um, uh, with anything. And, and so you're comparing apples with apples here. So, you know, using this, this particular classification system based on contained copper, giant is defined, um, a giant copper deposit is defined as uh, uh, not quite 3.2, to 10 million tons of contained copper. And above that, you've got super giants above 10 million. And then, 
and then as, as you know above that where the you know the Escondidas and the Chukis and the Grassbergs are they, they they're up in what's um, called the behemoth category of course geologists having the, a flair for the for, for the dramatic so I'll be using this and I'll come back to this each time that we're we're looking at, at, at the examples in the Vicuña district and then comparing them back to some of these the, these known uh, um, deposits So the Vicuña district really is, is it's a story that, that, that started off really about a gap. It's, it's a story about a gap and, and, and why a gap? Well, back in 1999, on, on, on the, in the wake of the um, uh, sale of El Adero by, uh, by, by the Lundin Group, which uh, became ultimately a very significant mine um, for, for Barrick, uh, the, the same geologist went looking for you know what next? You, you know, and uh, they they liked this area here, um, in this gap, and it was a gap because at that time in, in the late '90s, um, there there had been two mineral belts to the north and south, to the north the Maracunga Belt, to the south the El Indio Belt. That a number of discoveries starting, I believe, in the you know in the early '80s, uh, and they've been defined over about you know twenty some years. And, and the gap in the middle where Vicuña is located, it, it, what was missing there, and it was why, why it was thought of as a gap, there's, there's two favorable um, volcanic formations that host the mineralizations that you see to the north and south and those other belts. And they were eroded away within this, this uh, gap area, uh, if, if you will. And you know, the, the, the understanding then was really, well, you know, it, if those two favorable uh, volcanic units that host that mineralization are eroded away, then likely is most of the mineral potential. So it, that, that gap area it, it was really thought of as an area of, of low mineral potential by some. Um, for the, you know, for the London geologist, Patricio Jones and the other Argentine uh, um, geologists there, you know, they really thought like prospectors do. And, and, and I think it's important when you, you know, I always think of there's a, different types of geologists and and there are geologists who really are prospectors at, at, at heart, and they, they tend to make up their own minds. Um, you know, these guys are technically excellent, like a lot of, of, of um, uh, prospectors and prospecting type geologists are. They, they make up their own minds, and there is lots of evidence already there. You know, satellite imagery had already uh, uh, come into vogue, was a useful new tool. Um, you know, as you already mentioned, the Fila was already identifiable uh, from the satellite imagery. There was, a, there was good reconnaissance work that had been done early on. Um, and, you know, disregarding the reasons why, you know, there could may or may not be mineral potential in this area, they went in and had a look. And that's very important because there, there's been a, quite a few successes that everybody knows and can point to their own favorite ones that, where, where, you, where you couple, you know, particularly prospectors that go into areas, you know, disregarding what the, you know, let's just call it dogmas of, of, of the time. And, um, you know, they'll go in and, and, and have a look. Now, those successes really need to be coupled with a, a um, and most successfully with an entrepreneurial group or an entrepreneur that allows those prospectors to get in there and have a few seasons of field work, particularly in, in, in uh, difficult areas to access, like, like this, this was back in the late 90s. There was no roads in there. You had to get in there by borough. So it took some time you know, to get in there, get, get your bearings and, and, and pound a bunch of rocks and, and you know, see if there was interesting things. But you know, this, this combination of if, if you're in an area with the right rocks that the prospectors have intuitively you know, gotten into and then worked, and you couple that with an entrepreneurial group. There, there's, you know, you can. This is this is really a um, the background to a lot of of discoveries of giant ore, ore deposits or giant metal deposits. You know, you can use your own examples, but the one that I'll bring up is, um, um, you know, Hemlo, which was found in 1982. I bring that up because I I got my start in the business in 1980, just working directly north of there, and Miranda had a copper zinc mine. Just north of there, and and um, you know, like others, I would have been driving in and out of that mine over top of a giant gold deposit, which was not supposed to be there because there there was an understanding then, uh, largely academic, of why you shouldn't find giant gold deposits in the Western Abitibi. You know, there was things like the metamorphic grade was too high, and all sorts of other uh, reasons to keep people from looking, frankly. 
And there is a, you know, a, a group of prospectors, McKinnon, Larch, and, and, and Richard Hughes that thought differently. And they were backed by a entrepreneur, Mary, Mary Pesham, who, who um, you know, thought they had a good idea, believed these guys and shared their vision. And it didn't take long for, you know, the Hemlo deposit to be found. Um, other examples, you know, Boise's Bay is another great example. You know, it's not, it wasn't supposed to be there. There were all sorts of reasons at that time why giant nickel deposits Right, uh, um, we're not supposed to be hoping in, uh, hosted in that type of, of an in environment, and yet a couple of good, you know, Newfoundland prospectors, you know, spotted a, a Gossonus Hill flying back from a day of, of diamond prospecting, and decided to, uh, you know, spend a few days pounding that Gossonus Hill, and and uh, you, you know, they had a great entrepreneur, you know, backing them by the name of, of Robert Friedland, of course, and, and the rest is history there. You know, other examples, you know, I mean, Canadian diamonds. Chuck 50, right? You know, not supposed to be there. Um, you know, in the Lundin world, there's there's one that we, we, we're we quite proud of. It's on the oil side as well, in the Northern Sea. Um, you know, Johann Sverdrup was a late discovery in the Northern uh, um, Northern Sea uh, uh, um, oil basins. And it was one of the most significant finds ever um, at that time, even in the world. And really, it was uh, simply some, some Nor Norwegian petroleum geologists who, you know, had different ideas that were unconventional. And they finally found someone to listen to them, um, in, in, you know, in, in, in the Lundin group. And uh, um, they thought, yeah, you know, this is great. And the rest is history there, too. So the, the point being made here, you know, giants do have their own rule books. Um, a lot of areas are not endowed until a giant discovered and all of a sudden, you know, they're endowed all of a sudden, right? And you, you know, um, I think you need to make a keep an open mind and 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 uh, look at things from the perspective of of you know is it um, keeping me from looking somewhere or or, or not? Go ahead, go ahead, Mike. So uh, you know what happened then? Of course, some a uh, uh, few uh, um, field uh, seasons and. Uh, the uh, Patricio Jones and his and, and his uh, Argentine geologists, um, you know, did some great work. It was a difficult area to get into. It took a while, but uh, discoveries were made, and um, you know, Philo became a, a discovery, a early stage discovery, and then others uh, prospects were found, and and discoveries uh, uh, were made by initial drilling. Those um, each of those, you know, in turn uh, developed into initial uh, resource stage projects, which is important because, um, you know, that's what you, you want to see any giant district, you're going to have ups and downs along the way, but they are, are going to, um, you know, uh, move forward successfully into resources and then better resources. And these are all good signs of a metal rich district. So look very quickly, just some um, industry analogs um, at scale clusters um, structures. So giant metal districts, you know, they do grow into district scale. They don't start that way, um, but um, they, they, they all grow into that, that scale. Um, and the scale is really tens of kilometers. On the left is Escondida there, um, you know, on, on the left side there, the, the original discovery was made and it has, um, you know, kilometer scale to it already and, and additional discoveries were made, but you can see that there's also a clustering there as well, um, that, uh, the, the, that these eventually grow into this district scale because there's more mineralized center and sometimes they coalesce. Uh, you know, into that district scale. Vertically as well, you're looking at a few kilometers of, of mineralization. So that's, you know, these things don't hide well. Um, you know, uh, on the right, I've added um, another copper deposit, a different type of copper deposit, right? And just emphasize that this isn't just porphyries that we're talking about here. Um, is Tenki Fungarumi in, in, in Congo. And, and if you look at the scale there, regardless of the deposit type again, you know, it's tens of kilometers. Right. These, these are outsized concentrations of, of metal that grow in, into district. They don't start as district, they grow in there. Go ahead, Vaughn. So the second tick box, if, if you will, um, that I think is a common characteristic are, are clusters. Clusters can be obvious and, and sometimes not so obvious. Um, here I've used the example of, of, of Red Dog. Uh, the, you can see there's a district-wide uh, um, 
a cluster of, of prospects and, and deposits there um, that, yeah, it, it, it illustrates the fact that there was a, a, a district or basin-wide formational event. But you can also see that there's a more local scale clustering where you have um, sort of a clustering of mineralized centers. And I mentioned before with Red Dog, Maine, you know, several um, zinc events, uh, mineralizing events, really enriching itself to give you that 20% uh, um, zinc. There, there are also, you know, less obvious clusterings. For example, you know, all good zinc geologists know that there's a clustering around two specific ages in the in the Earth's history um, that you get. Uh, there's two significant zinc events. Uh, this is Red Dog's an example of the of the younger one, right? Um, so sometimes the clustering is is obvious. Sometimes it's not so obvious as as we'll see. And the last and probably the most fundamental characteristics that all giant metal deposits share uh, is the plumbing system, the structures. And these can be of different types of structures, but they are really the plumbing system. The example I'm using here is, is the Oyotogoi district in, in Mongolia. And uh, I know it's a colorful map there. And so I, I threw in some, some obvious blue arrows, um, which, which highlight what you can see there is a very linear clustering of, of, of mineralization. That 20 kilometer long stretch there between those two arrow, arrows is actually 20 kilometers of, of continuously mineralized uh, um, uh, um, porphyry intrusions uh, along that uh, sort of lineation, if, if you will. So there was obviously a very significant regional structure um, that, uh, that, that controlled the emplacement of those metal rich magmas and then the, the uh, distribution of the metals from um, being precipitated from hydrothermal fluids. So that, that, that's really it. it, it it's it, it, the structures concentrate all of these, these uh, uh, metal rich processes into the same rock column um, over, over a period of time typically. And, and, and that's how you get these outsized concentrations of, of metals. I want to point out here that that scale again is 20 kilometers. It's the same scale that we're seeing in the previous slides there, right? Tens of kilometers is what you're dealing with on, on, a, on a regional district. It's also in this case, 20 kilometers, as you'll see, is, is the distance between uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the Vicuña district between Filo and Los Alados, along which there is a map continuous, continuous 20 kilometer long trend. So now let's look at Bakunia uh, specifically now, and let's see if we can tick some of the same, same boxes in comparison here. So on the left is a, a district scale uh, map, just emphasizing some of the geological features to, um, to illustrate uh, the points, to, to tick the boxes. You see the same boxes in the upper right-hand corner there. Um, so, so scale, right? When you when you look at the scale of the Vicuña district, you'll see at the bottom there, there's there's uh, about 10 kilometers uh, uh, um, east-west between uh, Filo del Sol and 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 uh, Jose Maria, right? Uh, within which there's a number of other prospects. North-south, you're looking at, as I mentioned, between Filo del Sol and and, and Los Salados, you're dealing with 20 kilometers. So it's that tens of kilometer district scale across which you're seeing a number of mineralized centers, all of which are kilometer scaled themselves. So that ticks the boxes in, in comparison to these giant uh, metal districts. Now clusters, you can see here, there is a, a district-wide clustering, as I mentioned, you know, uh, of, of uh, early stage undrilled prospects up to uh, prospects that have seen now a lot of drilling and we'll, and we'll get to uh, looking at the individual components here. But that clustering is, is, is strictly there. And as I mentioned, there, sometimes there's a temporal or, or clustering in time. Uh, the structure on, on the left there has localized an earlier age of mineralization um, that includes Filo del Sol and, and, uh, and Los Salados. But that's an important age of mineralization that you also see in the Mar Maracunga mineral belt to the north and in, in the El Indio belt to the south. Additionally, in the Vicuña district, on the right there, you see there's a second regional structure that goes through that district. That localizes the Jose Maria uh, um, deposit in addition to the Casarones deposit just to the north of, of the map here as, as well. And that's an older age of mineralization that is also seen in the district um, um, to, to the north in the Maracunga belt. 
So you've got a clustering there, uh, both spatially and temporally, which is really what you want to see if you're in a favorable area to have multiple mineralizing events at, at kilometer scale that add up to the tens of kilometers district scale. Um, and I've already mentioned structures there, and this is part of the reason why we really like the Vicuña district. And we think that uh, there's a lot more to, to be found. Not only do you have uh, two important regional scale uh, um, uh, uh, structures there that are controlling the emplacement of two favorable ages of mineralization, but they're both converging towards each other. As you see in that map, they're towards the north. And I'll get to that later, but we believe that is a very important uh, um, feature that makes it even more favorable for uh, additional discoveries. So now we're gonna look at some of the individual components. Every giant metal district is going to have to have at least one, if not more, you know, giant metal deposits. So we'll look at the the ones that have have were, were discovered early on, and it's and it's uh, um, now seen a uh, um, resource uh, uh, base on, and and the first being Los Salados. This is currently the largest uh, um, resource in, in the district. Um, if we just look at the indicated resource there, there's eight million tons of of, of copper in, in contain copper in that indicated resource. Now, if we go to that, that um, SEG classification system, 8 million tons comes in at the higher end of um, what is a, a, a giant copper deposit. And that's important because now we can, you know, fairly compare that and use that term against, you know, whatever copper deposit we, we you know, we wish to in Chile or, or, or around the world. It's a, it's a fair comparison and we're using it with the uh, the more the higher level of confidence uh, category of indicated resources, now a lot of those indicated resources um, came up into the indicated category from 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 inferred through additional drilling, and so we know at Los Salados that there's a very high level or a high percentage of of inferred that 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 converts over into indicated and already in that track record. So if we look at the inferred resource there there's about two and a half million tons of additional contained copper in a third resource. So let's say that most of that does convert over with additional drilling. You know, that now, you know, combines, uh, that, that totals up over 10 million tons of contained copper, right? Now, when you go back to the classification system, that puts it up over into the supergiant category. And that is significant. We're not just kind of waving our arms and saying, hey, it's a supergiant. It, it's a super giant in that classification system. And you can use other classification systems, but at least now we can start comparing apples and apples with other better known, more famous copper districts. Keeping in mind as well at Los Salados that there's also over 10 million ounces of contained gold and a lot of silver as well. But we're just talking about contained copper, not copper equivalent, just copper. Thanks, Wayne. So let's talk about Philo del Sol. Now, Philo is earlier on in its resource development story here. Um, we'll talk a bit about that. Now, in the photograph that you see there, there's a 12 kilometer long arrow that we've marked in there. And that really is the arrow that follows that original uh, color anomaly that you can see you know, from space you know, in, in, in the satellite image that took Patricio Jones and his geologists into this area. Uh, and that was the first discovery. And that 12 kilometer long trend is now mapped out. It's all mapped and sampled at surface. It's a continual zone of, of various uh, um, types of alteration there. Um, there's clearly more than mineralized the center, you know, along that 12 kilometers uh, associated with uh, geochemical anomalies, et cetera. But it's only the first four kilometers that you see in the foreground there from the left of the, that arrow through where you see there the green rocks the, the, that, that uh, is a uh, zone of calcanthite at, at surface there. And up to where you're seeing on the right, the, the limit of the drill roads, that's about four kilometers. And it's only that first third of that, of that 12 kilometer long mineralized trend that has seen any drilling. And principally, the you know the vast majority of, of, of that drilling, you know, was that early uh, uh, work that was done over a number of field seasons at Philo, um, in part because of the copper you see at surface there. But it was a very interesting zone of mineralization that uh, has now uh, um, developed into a um, a copper oxide resource that you see there. 
uh, with indicated and inferred, if you added those up, there's not quite 2 million tons of contained copper there. So that would, if you look at the client size classification, would put it into a very large copper deposit. But keeping in mind that this is simply based on the shallower drilling that um, uh, developed into this pre-feasibility study project that has some good economics related to it, that really just resent, represents the resource in that first four kilometers of the trend from that lower drill road up to the top of the ridge. So it's really what's inside that ridge as, as an oxide cap. And it wasn't until a number of years later, this earlier this year, when uh, you know, the exploration got around to drilling some deeper holes below that PFS uh, uh, project uh, and slightly to the north of Long Strike. And, and you know, what was transformational, of course, was the intercepts that came out and not just one long intercept of high grade sulfide mineralization, but a number of them. Hundreds of meters, some, you know, a, a few over a kilometer long of uh, very significant, you know, over, you know, 1% copper equivalent type, type grades, something very different from the copper oxide resource that that you know, can, is contained within that pre-feasibility stage project. That project is, is actually quite important for if there's, if there's any if, uh, you know, project that comes with the sulfides that have been drilled off below, that'll make it an economic strip. And so it's important to know and it allowed a lot of information and an understanding of, of what could be at Philo before those holes earlier this year were drilled. So let's go on to the next one there, Voight, because it's, it's, we'll come back to um, the example we brought up before on regional ore structures at, at Oyotogai. So this is a long section of Oyotogai. And, and if you note, it's the same, the same distance of mineralized train as you got at, at Philo there, that uh, about 12 kilometers. Now, of course, there's been a, a lot more exploration resource development at Philo uh, or at, um, at, at Oyotogai, but it's the same scale and that's important to give you an idea of where we are in the resource development at Philo in comparison to uh, a known uh, giant as Oyotogai. But we'll go through a bit of the history there because there is some, some parallels that you can draw between the two. In 1997, BHP um, made the initial discovery on the only surface mineralization at Oyotogai where that pit that's in current production now uh, in the center there called uh, the Southern Oyu deposit. And it was it was a pretty decent discovery. You know, there was an ox, there was a leach cap and a, and, and a, 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 some you know secondary enrichment, etc. Um, it was certainly no indication of what was to come. I, I, I think it, you know it was about four hundred, little over four hundred million tons of half a percent copper and and some decent gold credits. Uh, something that perhaps you know if you're in Arizona or Chile, it would be a no-brainer. Um, now you know perhaps the you know BHP was thinking, well, this is you know, first mover in, 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 a, in a higher risk jurisdiction that's not a mining country in Mongolia. And, and perhaps that came into the thinking, I don't know. But, uh, you know, what did happen is they decided to divest to um, Ivanhoe, give them a track into 100% of the project. And, you know, um, Robert Friedland brought in some pretty smart geologists who, you know, thought that this, that there was something really special here. And, you know, um, went ahead and, and, and did some pretty aggressive drilling that led to the success and the discovery. Uh, when they drilled those deep holes, a long strike of that initial modest discovery that was open fittable, right? And they discovered a Hugo Dummett deposit, you know, and there's lots of 2% copper and, you know, a gram of gold. So there was something very distinctly different. And going back to the example of Chuki Kamada as well, you, you know, you, you can't be too sure that that initial discovery, what you were looking at first, is, is going to be representative of, of the district. Something very different was found here. And, and in this case, something, something much better was found here. Um, you know, so what we've done here now is, is at the same scale, is overlaying on top um, that uh, the surface trace of phyllo with the deep drill holes um, that we've drilled th this year. And, and those deep drill holes with the high grade intercepts you see in the center there, the, the, those long purple um, um, intercepts. Now we purposely overlaid the conceptual PFS open pit at Philo on top of the current in production pit at Oyotoya, which was the initial discovery. The reason, the reason being is that that initial copper oxide zone at Philo 
you know, it's a pretty good project for, for, for this oxide, oxide zone being open pitable, but it really didn't reflect what was to come next with that deep drilling. And you know, the 20-year commitment that Lundin had in this, in, in this district, this is something that we knew was, was, was special early on. Little did we know that drilling those holes, we would get into something like this. But the comparison with, 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 with uh, Oye Toga, I think is a very fair one in that this is early on in the, in the resource stage development. So if we look at some of the transformational holes and, and really the one that, that is the transformational hole that, that was drilled this year is hole 41. And yeah, to put it in context here, um, you know, there's hole 41, um, 858 meter intercept of 1.8% copper equivalent, you know, stacked up against the world's largest building there. What I'd like to point out here, I mean, that, that compares favorably scale wise. What I'd like to point out here is a great example of clustering because within that mineralizing process that can give you hundreds of meters of, of good mineralization there. There's another process going on here that, that, that on top of that has enriched a part of that hole to give you 160 meters of five and a half percent copper equivalent. So there's something in addition to that long hundreds of meters of mineralizing process, there's another process that, that is further enriching it. And that's kind of the less obvious clustering that you see in giant metal deposits. And at the scale, I mean, geologists will sometimes see this over a few, you know, tens of centimeters and perhaps a prospect or something, but 160 meters you have to pay attention to. Now, we don't know the geometry of this yet. That's all to come in the holes that we need to drill. But we do know that this is very significant enriching process within a very broad, very significant uh, 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 zone of mineralization that is going to add tons here extremely quickly to the resource base. And on that, just to provide a more context of the scale here, on the bottom there is the same long section, um, zooming in a little more. The purple, of course, is, is, is the big intercepts that were drilled earlier this year, the very high, long, high-grade intercepts. And, it, and then the top there is, 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 is the same thing in plan view. The blue box, which, is a, which represents a one cubic kilometer square, you could take all of, of Los Alados, which is 3 billion tons of, of resources. And as you recall, it's it, you know, over 10 million tons of contained copper and over 10 million ounces of gold and could fit into essentially the zone that we've drilled there this year, right? And, and, and that is only about maybe 30% of the four and a half kilometer mapped mineralized trend at Philo which is only a third of the 12 kilometer long mineralized trend that, that we see at Philo, Philo, but that we've had just a few initial drill holes on. So just to emphasize the scale here, but also Philo's very early on in its resource development history. And, and, and we fully expect that this is going to, to significantly grow resource wise with lots more to come. I mentioned the example of expect the unexpected early on with you know, a great tin deposit hiding you know, at Nevis Corvo within a, a, a giant copper zinc deposit. You know, it, we've been talking a lot about at Philo, you know, the copper and, and, and gold there. If you just remove that and, and just say, you know what, just look at the silver, you know, maybe that, you know, what you can see here is a very significant silver discovery already. And that's what giants do. Again, it's another sort of perspective on that cluster concept, if you will, right? It's, it's things happen in the same, same place. So, you know, there's a very significant silver deposit that's hiding within a copper gold deposit at, at, at Philo. It really is, you know, a lot of giants are a dumping ground for metals in the same column of rock. Go ahead, boy. So the last example here, or the last box to tick at Philo is, is structures. We've already talked about this, but just to show you visually on the left there is, um, you know, the, the, the map, uh, a geological map of Philo. The colors there are all the various uh, um, types of alteration um, with, it, with which, uh, you, you know, there's, there's surface mineralization um, if we brought the geochemistry on top of that. Um, uh, the first four kilometers of which have seen any drilling. 
uh, of which there's a 12 kilometer long trend that takes you all the way up to the next prospect there called Poultra's Cliffs. And that's just, you, you know, as you see there, bringing it into the, into the district scale, that's only the first few kilometers of a 20 kilometer long mineralizing trend that also controlled the emplacement of Los Salados. As I mentioned earlier though, there is another structure here that is controlled emplacement of, of a, an older age of, of porphyry copper gold mineralization, uh, localizing the deposit at, at, at Jose Maria there and just off to the North Casarones. And I also mentioned that this, these, two, these two regional structures here, or structures if you will, converge towards the north. And as they do, we, we, there, there is more detailed evidence that as they do, you're getting cross structures joining these two structures. And as they approach, they start to act as in fact, one large regional structure here that's controlling mineralization. And that's why we're starting to see a, a greater concentration, we believe of, of, of prospects as well as these two regional ore structures converge. One of the examples of we really excited and, and we haven't talked about before and we can now uh, is Les Pilas. And, and, and it's located where that arrow is there, just off about five kilometers northwest of, of Jose Maria and about 10 kilometers northeast of, of Philo, about halfway, almost exactly halfway between the, the, these two converging um, regional uh, structures. So let's just go to, to a, a photo of, of Las Pilas. So we are, we are looking here just off to the uh, um, northwest. Uh, uh, the Jose Maria uh, um, uh, advanced uh, um, project is five kilometers behind us. The cliffs in the foreground there, and what you see in those rusty rocks below those craggy looking cliffs has been continuously mapped through to both Jose Maria in the background, but also uh, um, Philo. Um, off into the foreground. Philo is just over that cliff on the left side and about another five kilometers down, down slope. So it's, it's, it, we know it's the same succession of rocks that we're seeing at Philo uh, um, as we're seeing here. The difference is that that Philo, those deep intercepts that we drilled this year, we had to drill through that upper craggy formation of rocks there. And it is a, an upper steam heated zone of, of alteration. It's barren of metal and it's very difficult to drill through at Philo. And it also is this barren cap on top of where get, the, the top of where the, uh, the metal is uh, um, emplacement starts. Whereas here at Las Pilas, as you can see, those rusty rocks that form sort of a, a bathtub ring around the bottom of that valley it, it, uh, right be below that, that barren zone of, uh, of altered rocks that are so difficult at Philo to drill through. So the Les Pilas here, we can literally set up the drill rigs below and, and, and essentially collar into the top of the equivalent top of the, uh, of the metal zone at Philo. So it's a pretty exciting uh, um, uh, um, prospect here uh, to be drilling at. Um, the, if there is a significant discovery made here, keeping in mind it's only five kilometers off in the, in the background um, to Jose Maria, which we feel is going to be the, the center of gravity for the district. It, it, it's really the first cab off of the rank in terms of mine development here. Um, but let's just talk quickly about um, you know, the, the copper resources at, uh, at Jose Maria. Now, if we look at the measured and indicated resources, as you see there, there's 3.3 million tons of contained copper. Let's go back to our, our SEG classification system. And that comes in over the bar, just, just over the bar into a giant copper deposit. So we, we now have two legitimate giant copper deposits, Los Salados and Jose Maria in the Vicuña district and an emerging giant. And I think we've demonstrated that there's gonna be a lot more res resources to come with a lot more copper to come at, at Philo, all right? So that's important. Now, one of the things, th there's been some very, very good research done here. And, and for those of you more technical in the audience here, there's a, a very good paper by, um, by Dick Silito that was put out not too long ago on, on Jose Maria here. And one of the things that comes out of it is, is an understanding that, that there's very rapid uplift in erosion here. About a, a, about a, a kilometer of rock has been eroded here, um, which is important because the top end of Jose Maria has been stripped away. So there's been a quite a bit of metal lost in, in what was very likely a much larger 
perhaps even a super giant copper gold deposit here. However, there's been a good trade off here because that same erosion, as you see in the photograph there, has, has produced a much more favorable mine development site. Um, you know, it's on the edge of a big broad valley. There's lots of flatter ground there uh, for plant, for tailings, uh, lay down yards, for waste, waste dump. But in addition to that, there is a very uh, a, a low strip. Um, super gene enriched uh, starter pit, which uh, provides some great payback ore. And all of this is very important for the first cab off of the rank, for the first mine uh, in the district. So we feel that was, a, although there's probably been a lot of metal loss in that erosion, it, it created a, uh, it's a fair swap for the, what's going to be the, uh, the, the first mine in, in, in the Vicuña district here. Um, so just as a, a last comparison, sure, if it walks like a giant and talks like a giant, and what we're leading to here is let's, let's now make one last comparison with uh, some of the well-known copper districts that we, uh, some of which we started talking about in the first slide. On the left there, the red dots, of course, are some of the famous uh, um, copper districts in, in Chile. And I pulled some of, the, some, some of the more famous ones off on the right, similar scale. You're looking at the geological footprints uh, um, of those. And, and, and the, the message here really, you know, Vicuña is there at, at the same scale as the others. In, to, to make a fair comparison now with, with what we're finding in Vicuña is not between the individual components of, in Vicuña, Jose Maria, Los Salados, Filo, and other deposits. The, compar the fair comparison to make is of the Vicuña district as a whole, because when you look at these other copper districts, for example, Tuki Kamata there, that was not all found at once, right? The initial discovery is, as White's pointing out there, right, is right there. That's the original pit that was in operation for, for, for many, many decades before some of the other deposits, right, Miratomich to the north, right, um, MMH to the south, et cetera. So it grew into a district, just like Vicuña is now emerging into a giant copper gold silver district and that's really the point so one last comparison here on that basis let's compare then the cunha apples to apples in terms of contained copper and where we are right now so going back to that same seg classification system let's just take the contained copper that we have at this stage in the vicuña district so los salados filos and jose maria and and if we take you know, the total resource contained copper there, you got about 16, 70 million, million tons of contained copper, which puts it in as, as a super giant. Now, if we just took the, the you know, the measured and indicated, the higher, the higher uh, confidence categories in, in Vicuña, those, those three, there's still 13 million tons of contained copper, which is still a super giant by definition, if you use that. And so now we can compare, it compares favorably back on some of those better known giant districts. And that's really the message here is it's not, we're just calling it a giant, using a fair comparison here and, and, and the number, it is a giant. And we can demonstrate that for example, with Philo, there's a lot more to come. And that's the important because all of these giant districts started at the bottom of that scale and grew upwards. The Cunha is now part way up that scale in the, in the lower end of, of the super giants there's gonna be a lot more coming at Philo which is gonna keep pushing it up. If there's additional discoveries, for example, perhaps at, at Las Pilas, that's gonna further push it up. Just the same resource development story that happened in any one of the giant copper districts around, around the world. So that's really why we can come back, you know, and we're confident with the thesis of this talk that, that Vicuña is in fact an emerging giant copper gold silver district. The, the last point I wish to, to emphasize here, um, you, you know, th there are, as I call them, the triumvirate uh, of, of uh, the components here. You, you know, Los Alados is the cornerstone uh, um, resource asset right now, um, you know, in the district. Um, Philo, I mean, Philo really is the ticket that gets us into the ball here. You can see what's going to come ahead, right? It's going to be very rapid resource. Uh, um, development story here uh, with perhaps some more local scale discoveries to be made. It's very exciting, right? Um, and Jose Maria, right? It, it's going to be the, the center of gravity for this district, the first cab off of the rank. It's really going to unlock 
the resource potential of this uh, of this district. The one other rare thing I want to point out before before leaving you is the fact that there is no senior company involved here. That's that's extremely rare to have an emerging giant at this stage of resource development being controlled by three junior companies belonging to the same group of companies. And that happened because of the foresight and 20 year commitment that was made by Lundin. A lot of people have flipped in and out of Argentina, right? Lundin has got a great, great history in Argentina. As, as the uh, video you saw, 30 years, three generations of Lundin's here, commitment to Argentina. And that's why they control 100% of what is an emerging copper gold giant copper gold silver district. And I'll leave it there. Um, thanks very much for listening. And uh, if there's any questions, Boyd and I would be more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much, Neil and Wojtek for a very inspiring and informative presentation. And uh, uh, I'm happy to say that we have quite a few questions. I think we should uh, dive right into them. But as a reminder, uh, if you want to ask a question, just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, we will be sure to bring them to the attention of uh, the right person. And uh, uh, quite a few of these questions are very company specific. So I think it's good for um, uh, Adam and uh, Jamie to, to join as well. So let's get right on to it. Uh, what about the next major milestones for NGX, Jose Maria and Philo? So might leave that with the respective CEO of uh, the companies to, uh, to answer. And let's start with the NGX. What are the coming milestones and timelines? Yeah, well, we've got two main projects, Los Salados and Valle Ancho. We're gonna be drilling both of those, uh, hopefully in the uh, first half of 2022. Um, so there, will, there should be a steady stream of drill results coming out in the first half of, uh, of next year uh, from both of those projects. So Viancho is an earlier stage, uh, large land package that we picked up in Catamarca province. Uh, it is uh, very similar in a lot of ways to what the Vicuña district looked like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, some really interesting uh, earlier stage gold and copper gold targets, uh, and we're gonna put some drill holes into it um, in the beginning of next year. And at Los Salados, um, we're gonna restart a drill program there uh, that is gonna focus on the high grade core of the Los Salados deposit and, and hopefully move that project along. So those are the, you know, the two big activities and, and uh, main sources of news flow for the, for the coming months. Thank you very much, Wojtek. And uh, over to Adam then for uh, Jose Maria to look at the timeline and milestones there. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, at Jose Maria, uh, very shortly, we'll be embarking on a large drill program, uh, which will be designed to do further uh, infill drilling within the deposit, uh, drill some deeper holes to hopefully convert some of our 700,000 tons of inferred material over to uh, indicated, and also use some of those meters to go and drill uh, our new exciting property, Las Pilas, and also we'll do some some geotech and, and water drilling as well. And so that program uh, should, should commence very shortly. Uh, then also hoping to make some uh, positive announcements on uh, progress with the government when it comes to fiscal stability. And also important is we submitted our ESIA to the San Juan authorities 10 months ago and hopefully uh, have positive news on that in Q1 of 2022. Thank you, and uh, Jamie? Sure, Robert, uh, so the story at Philo is, uh, is going to be the drill bit. Uh, we'll have hopefully seven rigs active throughout 2022 on the project. Three key objectives. Uh, number one, trying to define the, the very high grade zone that we discovered last year around hole 41. We'll also work towards uh, a, a zone in the middle of the deposit where we'll look to tighten up the drill spacing and help uh, develop the information, build out our, uh, our, our geological model and, and work towards, uh, you know, ultimately gathering the information towards uh, an updated resource. 
and then uh, we'll continue to explore. So there's lots of, uh, as you saw with some of those overlays, lots of uh, wide open space to the north, to the south, at depth. And uh, and certainly we haven't come anywhere close to finding the, the edges here. So look for regular and consistent drilling and drill results throughout 2022. Thank you, all three of you. Good answers. Uh, and we have a question that uh, you can decide uh, who is to answer amongst you, but that's uh, on uh, the ESG issue. So there's a lot of uh, focus globally on ESG. And uh, because of that, do you foresee any challenges in getting approval of the EIAs and the funding for the projects? Sorry, Robert. Mm -hmm. Ad, maybe Adam? Yeah, I think so. so uh, no, I think it's a, it's a rigorous process uh, with, with San Juan when you're going through the, the ESIA, um, but also we, we do it to the toughest international standards as well. And it's been good dialogue uh, between the authorities in San Juan who are overseeing the, the EIA approval process. And uh, I think the current market and backdrop that we're in and the world needing a lot more copper I don't foresee it being an issue uh, financing the CapEx of Jose Maria. Thank you, Adam. And uh, we have the next question from uh, a uh, person attending from Norway, uh, thanking for a good presentation and asking when we can expect updated, indicated and inferred resources for Filo del Sol. So over to you, Jamie. Sure. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a strategic question. I think even uh, being debated amongst management here, it's uh, wh where do you where do you sort of put the pin in what we believe to be uh, just a, a massive deposit? So the, the challenge is, do we come out with a, a two billion ton, a three billion ton resource? Uh, you know, ultimately that it, that ends up being a subset of, of something much much larger. And, uh, you know, are, is there a portion of the investment community that then says, okay, well, well, this is what Filo del Sol is. It's an X billion ton deposit. Let's move on. So, you know, I think what's important for us is to continue to move the market and move expectations along with where we see the size and, and scale of, of Filo growing. Uh, we're certainly going to focus on gathering the information that uh, allows us to, uh, to build that resource. But uh, I, I'm not really guiding yet specifically as to when we'll be in a position to, uh, to put new numbers out. I mean, we're drilling, I guess, if I can add, you know, we're drilling some pretty important holes at Philo that's still, it's still a moving target. And like Jamie says, you don't want to put in a pin too early uh, until you've made sure that you've drilled out to the edges, which we're far from doing. Thank you very much. And uh, then we have a question that I know you have been asked many times during this uh, past few weeks of road showing. So basically you spun off all three projects from NGX resources. I assume for risk reasons, would merging them all again at some time make sense? Well, I, I, maybe I can take that one and uh, other guys can chime in. I mean, I, we, you know, we didn't spin off the project solely for risk reasons. In fact, I wouldn't, you know, I would say the primary reason that we spun projects off was for shareholder value and to create shareholder value, which I think we've successfully done. You know, a, 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 another consideration was kind of limiting dilution. The projects were at different stages. And so, you know, uh, you don't want your exploration program at Philo, for example, which is, which is very important, but you don't want that necessarily diluting your shareholders' interests in Los Alados or, uh, or Jose Maria. So the, the spin-outs were really done for value creation um, reasons, which you know, they very successfully accomplished. Um, you know, also wanted to limit dilution. And third reason that we did it was or that we did it for was to allow investor but also management focus on a on a on a single on a single project. And that's been important. You know, these are these have grown into big projects. And they, they require a lot of uh, management focus. So I think, you know, those were the three reasons. Now, you know, the number one driver here being shareholder value. Um, you know, if it made sense down the road and we thought we were going to create shareholder value by doing something different or, uh, you know, putting together a different corporate structure, well, we'd certainly go to our shareholders to ask them. Um, but, you know, if it, if it made sense, uh, sure. But, um, you know, right now we're creating a lot of value in the, in the current structure and, 
I don't know. Adam, do you have anything to add to that? I, I agree with you, Wojtek. I think the path is, is quite clear for all three companies. Uh, you know, at Jose, we're, we're committed to, to, uh, to further advance the, the project and, and hopefully get into construction in the middle of next year. At, at Philo, it's very clear that you have to continue to, to drill off this, uh, this phenomenal deposit. And Boyd, I think, you know, with your Biancho and, and, and Masalados, uh, have your hands full there. And, and the path is very straightforward for all three companies. So right now, it's not a discussion that we're having about putting these companies back together. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Wojtek. We have a question that is more uh, for the whole uh, district. What are the main infrastructure hurdles in developing this district? Is it fair to say that water availability is less of an issue, less of a challenge on the Argentine side of the border? I think, I think water is, is, is very uh, precious and uh, you have to, to go about it uh, the right ways when, when you use it. I think the advantage Argentina has is uh, that you're not required to build a desalination plant on the coast and pump water to your project uh, like you would be required to do in Chile, which would add a significant capex to your project. So in that sense, uh, it, is, it is favorable. Thank you, Adam. And uh, quite a few questions on uh, financings. Uh, I know uh, Wojtek, you have just done a round at uh, NGX, but we still have a question. When do you expect uh, the next financing round to take place? I mean, we do always get these questions. I would, I would like to point out that we're uh, less than six weeks away from uh, you know, raising $25 million, which was, you know, the, you know, kind of the, well, it was more, more than we initially set out to do. There was extremely good demand for that financing. Uh, I mean, I think we, you know, we raised the amount of money that we, that we think we're going to need. We're going to make it last as long as we can. Yeah, I think when it, when it comes to, to financing, we don't want to do anything punitive to the projects and, and, yeah. and give up a, a royalty or, or stream too, too early. Those are the levers we can pull on, but the family uh, remains firm, firmly committed in advancing all three projects and, and will stand behind the companies uh, when cash is needed and required to continue to move the projects forward. I think uh, what, what you'll see here is, yeah, we've been here for moving these projects forward for, and, it's, and it's taken some time, but we've never slowed down. We've always, we've always been behind these projects. Yeah, you know, at Jose Maria, when we were doing the pre-feasibility study and then on the feasibility study, I think we were one of the few companies uh, or a few projects in the industry that was moving forward on that timeline. And so uh, we have no, no interest in, in slowing down and, and the family will stand its corner to make sure we can continue to progress with all three companies. Yeah, I think, I think this is probably true for all of the companies. I mean, we look to finance on the back of success. You know, if we drill some great holes at Valle Ancho or we want to follow up more at, at, at Los Salados and we have great success there and we need more money to do that, we'll, we'll look at, um, you know, like all the companies, we'll look at additional money. But right now, on the NGX side, I feel like we're we're very well financed. Thank you, both Wojtek and Adam. And uh, we have a lot of questions, which we're very pleased with. So we better crack on with them. Uh, the next one, you're communicating this as a district. Say a major is interested in one of the assets, even if the price is then right for those shareholders, would that potentially complicate the story for the remaining two companies? It's hard to say. <laughs> I don't know. It, it depend on the vision of that potential major. It's too. Yeah. All, I, all, all we are is focused on moving the district forward and controlling what we control. Yeah, I think I think I would I would give the same answer. It's uh, you know we we focus on controlling what we can control, and you know if uh, if anything comes in out of left field that's a uh, that adds to shareholder value, it'll get looked at regardless of what it is. Thank you. And while we have you on the screen, Wojtek, uh, there is a question about NGX and whether NGX could be looking at doing another spin-off of the, either of the projects. Well, not not right now. Um, I mean, I think it's important, you know, these spin-outs uh, kind of don't happen by themselves and they're not, you know, they're not successful or they're not sort of inherently successful. And I, I, I think the reason that, that both the Philo and the and the NGX Jose Maria spin out was successful was because there was a lot of planning that went into it and it was done for the right reasons at the right time. And one of the critical factors is 
just making sure that the projects are, are at a point where they can support a standalone, uh, a standalone company. You know, right now, NGX has two main projects, Los Alados and, and Viancho. Viancho is still pretty early stage. Um, you know, so, so I, it would be premature to look at any kind of a split of the company there. But of course, you know, if we succeed uh, and it makes sense and we think we're going to add value, sure, we look at them down the road. We're good at these spin outs. We've done a bunch of them now. We've created a whole bunch of shareholder value. And, and uh, yeah, we're not, you know, we'd certainly look at that if it made sense down the road, but, but nothing in the, um, you know, in the, in the near future. Thank you. And then we have a, a question with an easy answer. Which company controls the Las Pilas Porphyry prospect? Jose Maria. Yep, good. I got that from a, a few attendees. Um, I think we need to make that Jose Maria symbol on the Las Pilas slide a little bigger. <laughs> we got that question a lot. And uh, what about uh, Potro Cliffs? What company is that in? That's also a question. Uh, it's kind of at the intersection of some ground that Philo and uh, NGX hold. And we have a question about the potential for, uh, is, there, is there exploration potential for deep and high grade sulfide material at Jose Maria similar to at Philo? Go ahead, Roy. We certainly, we certainly hope so. <laughs> I think no, in the right way. <laughs> I think I think there's good potential to convert a lot of that 700 million tons of inferred over, and, and, and then you know, the upside for, I mean, sulfide. I think it comes with through the the expiration and, and lost pilots and the potential there. And we have a question here on uh, the Argentine uh, legislature: what they could, uh, what kind of changes could they make to its mining law to improve the competitive position internationally of Argentina as a mining nation? I think, you know, it's been uh, very encouraging working in Argentina and, it, and the San Juan government, also the federal government. Uh, you know, we, we have meetings on a regular basis and the dialogue is, is very open um, and, and, and happy with the progress. And today there's, you know, announcements of uh, amendments to Decree 234, which will allow us to have uh, the ability to, to keep not bring more of our capital back, more of our revenue back into Argentina. So we'll be able to keep uh, up to 60% offshore, which I think is a, a right step, a good step in the right direction. And so uh, happy, happy with how things are progressing. So uh, on that issue too, uh, if the uh, San Juan regulators approve Jose Maria's ESIA in the first half of 2020, of, uh, uh, 2022, what subsequent permitting steps are required? Or what's the timeline? After EIA approval, you go into uh, sectoral uh, permits, which uh, you know we're preparing now uh, and believe that that timeline will, will, will vary depending on the, the sectoral permit that you're going after. Thank you. And another question for you, Adam. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the fiscal stability agreement discussions you're having and have the midterm elections in Argentina had any impact on the timeline for such discussions? No, I, I, I haven't seen, you know, the level of communication and, and the engagement we have uh, has not wavered and it hasn't changed uh, due to the midterm elections. Uh, it's, it's good communication between, between ourselves and, and the government and uh, encouraged with, with how things are progressing. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and um, looking at Jose Maria too, do you plan for the plant project at uh, Jose Maria to act as the plant for the two other projects as well? I know that's a question that you get a lot. Yeah, I think, I think right now, you know, we, we, we make steps, uh, for instance, to, to leave room for, for a fourth line for potential to bring in other deposits. But again, you know, focus on on Jose Maria and, and getting getting the the that project up and running, and then you know having the ability that you're into your your uh, high solvitation zone quite quite quickly, where you can get quick payback. Um, but down the line, how we're designing it, uh, we'll have that availability uh, and, and space to add add additional capacity if we wanted to bring in a, a, a regional deposit. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, here we have a more geologically detailed question for Neil. Uh, and it's quite a long one, but I will read it out. Looking at the region you talk about, Neil, the composition and metal endowment of the porphyry seem to indicate that they were tapping subcontinental lithospheric mantle of different composition from 21 to 14 MA. Is this an important pattern for evolution in mantle composition over time? Also, the occurrence of rapid erosion and intrusion uplift and crystallization, uh, a unique facet of the younger fault systems, causing the telescoping of the high sulfidation system and the contemporaneous porphyry at Philo, or could such a geological process have operated in the older systems? Well, I think just to make the answer easier for Neil, I think this is, uh, you know, this is maybe a good time to just talk about that, some of that telescoping uplift erosion discussion that we had in some of the earlier presentations maybe yeah that's like that. that's really all i was gonna respond i mean um you know if you go back to that slide with the gap you know why is why are those two volcanic formations missing in the gap because that gap you know had more rapid likely had more rapid erosion all right uplift and erosion and that's really what the research that's that's nicely summarized in Dick Soloto's paper and, and the regional mapping um, that uh, Lenin has, has done, um, uh, you know, in the district. So that rapid uplift and, and, and erosion, that coupling there, we think has got very much to do with the enrichment that you're seeing at Philo in those deeper holes. Um, that is a, if you will, a you know, a telescoping type of, of enrichment process. Um, you know, I would agree with you there. Beyond that, hey, look, I mean, maybe over a couple of beers or something, we can discuss that. Um, I, I'm not the, you know, the Central Andes ex tectonic expert here, but I, I do agree with the direction you're going with some of these questions in, in that it's a special area where things have certainly come together. Um, that's about uh, as far as I think I, I'm prepared to answer that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is for uh, NGX and for Wojtek. Uh, what about considerations about bringing uh, another project into NGX? Or are you now fully focused on uh, Los Elados and Vallancho? Uh, uh, our hands are pretty full with Los Elados and Vallancho right now. I mean, we, we've you know, we're, we've always got our eye out for the next opportunity, but um, I think in this particular corporate vehicle, uh, our hands are full for the next six to 12 months. Thank you. And um, we, the same uh, shareholder would also like you to speculate a little bit on share price, if you're comfortable with that. You said that- I, am, I, I, I saw a question on this list that I'm super happy to answer, and I'm going to read it. Uh, is a six fold run in the NGX share price in the cards? <laughs> It's the best question of the day. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, you know, all joking aside, I mean, I think, you know, part of the NGX story, I think, is a little bit of a re-rating um, of, of our stock. I think if you if you look at the size and the quality of the Los Alados resource and compare it to some of the other projects out there that have, you know, maybe been a little bit more actively promoted over the last uh, six to 12 months, I think, you know, there's a, there's a significant gap between the valuation that NGX has even after some share price appreciation recently on some of those other projects. And what we're going to be working on in the, in the next six months is, uh, is reducing that gap through you know the drill programs that we plan uh you know and hopefully and hopefully success i'll leave you with one last point because it kind of answers another question uh, which was you know why should uh you know i have a lot of money and philo convinced me that i should put some of my winnings into into the other companies and you know i think it's um you know we we all uh, have shares and are enthusiastic shareholders of all three companies. I mean, I think, you know, there's slightly different kicks at the can with, with each one slightly different focus. Um, but I think, you know, part of the reason for the district scale presentation was to just, you know, convince you that these are all pieces of a greater whole. And, uh, and, and I think on the, on the, on the NGX side, the last thought I'll leave you with is that um, the best hole or the second best hole drilled in the world, copper hole drilled in the world, in the last two years was hole 41 from Filo del Sol. And that's the hole that really sparked, you know, the well-deserved uh, and spectacular rally in that, in that share price. But what most people don't know is that the third best hole drilled in the last three years was a geotechnical hole 
uh, that we drilled at Los Alados that was not specifically targeting gray, but was actually drilled for engineering reasons. And that's the number three hole, one step behind um, hole 41 at Fila del Sol. So, you know, I think there's a lot to come at Los Alados. And uh, I personally think that's a, that's a great investment, which doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, at all diminish um, the potential that we see in the other two companies, which I think is awesome. Buy all three. <laughs> Thank you. Good answer, Wojtek. And uh, we're having a lot of questions tonight. I'm trying to bundle them together. So I hope uh, most of you have had your questions answered. We have one more here for um, Jamie. For Philo, what options are being considered to improve drill productivity? Yeah, you know, it's it's something that we've struggled with at Philo for, for many, many, many years. Uh, certainly, it's a combination of, of ground conditions, and just challenges um, in terms of drilling the, the ground, but also uh, in terms of, a, you know, good quality equipment availability. There's been lots of activity picked up in San Juan province in particular in terms of drilling. There's lots of excitement in Argentina, which is fantastic. But uh, for, for all three of our companies, what it's meant is that uh, you're struggling to grab um, good rigs and uh, experienced crews. So, you know, we're working at that. Um, we're, uh, we're hopeful. Uh, one, one of the things that we can do is, is start using the uh, international border between Chile and, and Argentina and, and bring in some um, drill crews and, and some good rigs from, from Chile to start uh, working at it there. And then you know, longer term, I saw a, a bunch of questions come in on this. Uh, it, it's interesting, actually, we had a chat about this at our last board meeting is, is uh, looking at options to potentially get underground and uh, putting in some kind of exploration at it, uh, allowing us to drill out of the elements uh, at, at uh, you know, more controlled conditions and, and using drilling from, from underground. So we eliminate having to go through that top four, 500 meters sometimes uh, that's barren, that sits on top in the bad ground conditions. We'll take a look at all of that. Clearly, it's uh, you know one of our number one focuses at Philo. If we can uh, start getting more meters out of the rigs that are there, then uh, we'll have more results to share. Thank you, Jamie. And here we have one shareholder asking if you are horse racing the three companies, is there a fierce internal competition between you? And uh, when we have all three of you here, you can all answer it. <laughs> I think there's a clear winner right now. <laughs> 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 yeah of course you know we're all uh you know we're all uh driven by wanting to succeed and beat each other i mean i i, I would classify it as friendly competition so you know in the lundine office here adam me and jamie are all in a row so we you know we work together we've all worked on on the three companies together for for many years here so i would characterize it as as friendly competition but for sure you know we compare share prices every day and and uh there's definitely a rivalry we want everybody wants their horse to, to be the fastest yeah uh, you know i think what's remarkable here and it's it's highlighted by a presentation like this is all of us sort of pulling these projects in the same direction so yeah i mean you want your you, you know these individual companies to do well but at the end of the day it's uh it, it's the fact that this lending group sort of entity uh, has a, a major ownership in this district, and we're all, we're moving them all at, at their different stages of development ahead towards um, you know towards uh, getting this district built. And um, each of us, I think, has a has a different role to play within that. And I think we'll be successful together along the way. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, that's actually the conclusion of uh, uh, answering all the questions we've had. I hope you all feel that your questions have been answered. Otherwise, you know where to where to find us to uh, email us and we can uh, respond to more questions. Certainly, uh, it's been a privilege having so many of you online for this presentation tonight. And it's been great to be able to present uh, the whole Vicuña district. And uh, we will certainly be returning to you. And next time it might be a presentation on uh, each one of the companies, but uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. And uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, much everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.